Hi, Richard. Hi, Tessie. How are you? I am super well, thank you. Having a good lockdown. It is so nice to see you. So nice to see you too. Yeah. Where are you at the moment? I am on a farm in the English countryside. I'm very lucky. I get to be able to exercise, have fresh air, see the spring start to unfold. So I feel very blessed. That's beautiful. Well, as a writer, that's the ideal. To have well, actually, for writers, it's like we love being on our own. I don't have to go out to dinner. I don't have to see anyone except for my partner, Robert. I just get to be on my own, think, create my worlds in my head. So, yeah, for introverts like me, lockdown has some strange benefits. <laughs> Fantastic. So for the people who, well, I want to share how I met you, Richard, because uh, meeting you was definitely one of the most amazing times of my life. And our friendship has been so strong and year long, and I appreciate you so much. So I, I met Richard because of our dear common friend, Gauthier, which is the husband of the Prime Minister of Luxembourg. I met you at your book launch for the book, Who Ki Killed Pete Beryl, which is part, it's the second book of a book series called The History of a Pleasure Seeker. Let me tell you guys, that book, it's so popular, that series, that it has been um, translated into English, French, German, Hungarian, Russian, Latvian, Mandarin, Italian, Dutch, Finnish, Polish, Czech, and so on. I need to stop there, but there's a lot of other translations. So you need to get these books, absolutely. Then I have as well a little treat for you, Richard. I did some research and I found some. I believe anything you read about me on the web. The all lies. History of the pleasure of a pleasure seeker. I found some reviews, which I will share with you all, uh, which I found really incredible, Richard. People talk about your work. It's really incredible. So I have here the Washington Post. History of a pleasure seeker is the best new, new work of fiction to cross my desk in many moons. Mason has written an unabashed romance, a classic. There is an almost magical quality to it that had me throughoutly engaged from first page to last. Then we have as well the New York Times. As if plucked from a patisserie display case, Mr. Mason's novel is a gorgeous confection. Pete is the rare character, the rare being whose unfailing charm and luck only make us cheer him on more. Wow. That's amazing. Now, let me read one more because there's so many. There's the Los Angeles Times, Liberty Journal Start Review, Kirkus Review, Publishers Weekly, Marie Claire, The Observer, Times Literary Supplement, The Independent, and there is, which I love, The Oprah Magazine. So, Richard Mason is the rare novelist who can write a very sexy book that never quit turns prurient. This book about pleasure is provocative joy. So there you go, guys. That's all I have to say well about it. Well, well done, Richard. So um, enough from reviews and what I know about it. Please, in your words, Richard, tell us about this series of the history of a pleasure seeker and how did you get into writing in the first place? Um, well, I've always written. I think I started to write my first book when I was seven. It ended up being about three pages long, but I've always been drawn to telling stories, to seeing, seeing people's lives in emotional 3D, uh, why people do what they do, the strange course of um, events that influence what happens to us and the decisions that we make. And I love putting that kind of complexity into language. That's my, my passion. And History of a Pleasure Seeker, came to you because I think, in a way, it's so easy to write about rape and murder and darkness, and there can be wonderful books on these dark themes, but people very rarely write about sex and pleasure and love, love in its real textured complexities, and joy, and the way that families, even if they have dysfunctions, and the family and Pleasure Seeker definitely do, they actually really love each other. And how do you make a drama out of that? And I thought that was an interesting challenge. And then this hero came into my head, Pete Barol. Um, the opening line of, of History of a Pleasure Seeker says, uh, the adventures of adolescence had taught Pete Barol that he was extremely attractive to most women and to many men. 
And I thought it would just be fun to follow a handsome, charismatic, but intuitive person, somebody who was often able to read the secret feelings of others and, um, and navigate through life and have adventures as a result of that. Wow, that sounds so intriguing. And I definitely will get, well, I have one copy, but I will definitely get as well the other book that you're having. Uh, um, tomorrow, actually. I hope I can get it here in Switzerland with the lockdown. So that's amazing. Well done on that. So for, for a person that wants to get into writing, for example, what would you give as, as an advice to say, hey, in order to write a book, this is where you start. And this is okay. what the journey will look like. I should say that I don't know what your journey will look like. The, the scary but amazing thing about being a writer is that we have to find our own path. So I can only tell you as truthfully as I can what my experience was and that yours will be very different. But what I'd say is if you want to write, you actually just have to start writing. And then don't judge yourself too harshly. The first draft of, the first, um, of my first novel, The Drowning People, was so bad, I didn't even finish reading it. But it showed me that I had the discipline to write. It taught me something about constructing sentences and building a story. And then I wrote it you know, many more times again before it was published. And what I always tell people is, think of Shakespeare, his first play, Titus Andronicus, pretty terrible play. But if he hadn't written that, he would never have written King Lear and Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet. And that's true of all of us. So if you really want to write a book, start writing, be disciplined dare to take the risk that your first effort will probably be really bad. And when it is, don't judge yourself. Keep on going. Get better. Very, very good advice, definitely, because I'm also thinking about writing my own book. So I'm, I'm working on a few. I'm episodes. very keen on a book by you, Tessie. Get going. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, it's, it's, I have been working on it for a long time, but it's just really, you know, I guess something that you must have come across as well kind of like a writer's block where you have an idea in your head but you just don't know how to get it on paper are there any exercises you can do that you would suggest that that just get it out of, of your head that's a good question I mean I think that for me I have to navigate the terror of will I be able to write this story can I take the thing that I'm beginning to put together in my head and actually make it what I want it to be uh, writers have to handle that sort of existential doubt and it's really tough particularly at the beginning and only as you carry that burden through life and start to make friends with it are you better able to carry it it never goes away but what i'd suggest and what i sometimes do if i just can't write you have to work out are you not writing because you're afraid or lazy in which case sit down make yourself do it or are you not writing because actually you need to think there's something complicated your brain needs to work out I don't always get it right, but it's, it's usually one of those two. And so if you need to think, then you actually shouldn't write that day. You should spend your time thinking. And I think that our world prizes productivity so much, it doesn't really give us time to think. But thinking is critical. Or if you're just being lazy or avoidant, you have to just do it. And what I quite like to do is I make these notebooks uh, full of thoughts and ideas. And, and I try to write something every day. So that just the joy of writing, keeping those muscles limber um, can continue, even if I can't quite see myself my way around a big challenge I'm facing in a book or a screenplay. Okay, wow. Well, yeah, I will definitely, I think uh, Ju Julian Hugh, American choreographer, she uh, posted something on her Instagram that you should do in the morning in order for these writer's blocks to go, that you should have a journal where for three pages, literally minimum three pages, you just throw out everything that comes to your mind. Whatever it is, no sentence structure, just now, just write it out like what? Would you think that's, a, would you say that's a good idea? That's what works for her. But what I, what I would say is that she and I identify the same problem. The problem is that you have to start writing and not be afraid that it might be bad. So her technique is that, Everyone trying to write their own book will have to find their own technique. That's not what I happen to do, but she and I are both grappling with the essential challenge, which is you have to keep going, even if you don't know it's going to be good. And in a way, that I forget who said this. I think it was Charles Rennie Macintosh, but I have it on my desk. Um, there is hope in honest error, none in the icy perfections of a mere stylist. And I remind myself that some great literature has flaws in it. 
the sentences do, sometimes the structures of a novel do, but it's beautiful and life-changing regardless. And I think perfectionism is the enemy of progress and in many ways it's the enemy of promise. Wow, that is so powerful. I definitely need to look that up. And if you can send me these quotes again, I will definitely put them as well under your link. Um, so I have so many questions to you, um, such as what is your favorite book? But before I get to that, um, what, how do you, just going with the, when, if I would be a writer, um, once you have the draft then, how would you think is the best way to approach finding a publisher, for example? How do you know it's a good publisher or the right publisher for you? How was that for you? That's a really good question. Well, I would say that you should never approach a publisher directly. First, you have to get an agent. But getting an agent can be hard. People submit a lot of, uh, a lot of manuscripts. So who do you approach? I think of novels that you loved, written by contemporary writers. Find out online who represents them because those agents might have taste that chimes with yours. And then you have to do whatever you can to get them to read it. So you send it to them, follow up with them, call them. I mean, don't harass them, but the squeaky wheel is usually the one that gets heard. Um, and then if you have a great agent, don't necessarily go for the first one, go for someone who really sees the kind of work you want to make, who believes in you. And if you find that person together, you craft the huge strategy of which editors to send it to in the hopes that you find someone that really connects with who you are and the work that you make. Wow, that is so valuable. You have no idea because I was thinking, you know, when I'm done, uh, you know, I was, my first thing would have been, let's find a publisher. No, definitely, definitely not. Uh, uh, this, this is so useful. Thank you so, so much. So That's moving on then to my question that I had before, what is your favorite book if it's not your own? I don't really have, favorites i have passions and they're too um, numerous to to mention but i think if i were to pick one book the book that was the stylistic inspiration actually of this book very different subject matter but the, the inspiration was an incredible novel called sweet francaise by irene morosky she wrote it i really strongly recommend anyone who hears this to read it don't read the back cover don't learn about the circumstances in which that book was written but it was written in the summer of 1942. She didn't have a lot of paper, didn't have a lot of time or ink. And so she's writing about this group of characters fleeing Paris as the Nazis are arriving. And because I think she didn't feel she had a lot of time, there's just no wasted time. You're just right into the story, but so truthfully and honestly, these beautifully, richly drawn characters with all their flaws, um, but, but held with real humanity by her. And actually, I love that book so much that I ended up scanning all the pages that I love with my underlinings. And I made in my house in London a huge collage. So literally on the wall of my study is an aesthetic manifestation of all the things I loved about that book. Wow. And because of that, I wrote History of a Pleasure Seeker by hand, the first draft in a, in a book to create that sense of pressure that creates concision. Too many modern novels are way too long because everyone can type now. Wow, that's incredible, by hand. That it's is really amazing, you need to show me that. I'm sure you still have that. I don't have it here, but what I do have is my other little thing that I love, um, which is, uh, hang on, I This is what I wrote Who Killed Pete Roll on, my typewriter. Oh, wow, old school, that's amazing. And what I, I, I never write at all on a word processor. The problem with a computer is that it encourages wordiness because we can all type and you can endlessly change it. So you change it and polish it and polish it. And that's when you get into icy perfectionism and that's not good. And you also lose what it originally was. So I loved writing by hand, but what I love about a typewriter is mm. it compels forward momentum. You just have to keep going. You can't really correct. And then at the end of the day, you have a page, an object, which is how you had it first time round. And often the next day I'll correct and I'll make lots of corrections. Then I leave it for three weeks and I read it again. On a computer, I'd never be able to access the original draft. But because I have a piece of paper that is an actual object, I can see what I first wrote. And usually I get rid of 60% of the corrections. Because what I find anyway is that I'm never a great judge of my own work in the immediate aftermath of having written it. 
Uh, and so, and there's also just something so satisfying about the sound of a typewriter. You get to the end of the page, you take it out, put another page in. There's a ritual to do with that that I really love. Wow, this is so inspirational. You give me so many ideas, so many new things to do. I will definitely try that as well. I will send you some and, and I will say, you know, for people thinking about writing, start writing by hand. There's something, it does something to your brain. It engages you by making something physically as opposed to just typing on a screen in Times New Roman, it looks like every word document you've ever written. There's, if it's in your own handwriting or something aesthetically distinctive, it makes your brain work in a different way. Absolutely. I make my kids as well write a journal in the morning and in the evening. Not yeah. much, but a little bit, because, and also by hand, because they said, oh, we can do it on the computer. And I said, no, I want you to write it out. Because it's kind of like you're just... This is my journal. I won't flick through this. This is super personal. But yeah, I try to do that too. Yes, exactly. So, um, wow, that's amazing. I will definitely get a Sweet Francaise. I will get a oh, typewriter. A I will get one from my partner as well because he, he wants to write something as well. And he's also been like, he does it on the computer. And I think this is a really good idea. Leave the computer. Abandon Microsoft Word. Step <laughs> away from it is my advice. Because it's so true. You always just go back. And I, I started doing that when I started writing my story about in my military and so on. And I was just, and I, exactly as you said, I was just going back and back and back and back. And you just fiddle and fiddle and move everything around and you kind of lose any sense of what was good about it in the first place. Absolutely. So um, we have almost ran out of time. So yeah, I know it's really sad. Time just flies. Very fast with you, Tessie. And you're having fun, but I don't let you go yet, my friend. Um, for everyone here listening to this right now, for your fans, for everyone who wants to become a writer, is there anything new about Richard Mason? Is there anything you want to share during lockdown uh, where you say this is a positive quote, something that keeps me going? Uh, is there anything, uh, a poem, or just something that you do or ritual where you say this is helping me during lockdown? and helps me to cope and stay healthy and happy? Well, I think there's a lot of sadness and suffering in the world right now. And I really feel for people who are affected by COVID and I'm so grateful, not only for the nurses and doctors, but all the essential workers who keep us, our society functioning. But at the same time, I think there's a real beauty in everyone being forced to stop, take stock, see the natural world, maybe appreciate our planet more. I mean, the decadence of our previous way of living, flying everywhere, the kind of Instagram lifestyle, didn't make anyone happy. And it just used tons of natural resources when the planet is a state of catastrophe. And I think that lockdown is a real opportunity for us all just to learn how to be agreeable. We all have to be around the same people again and again, day after day, just being kind and compassionate to them and not making such a fuss about your own ego. These are quite beautiful things. And I meditate every day. That's what, and I play the piano. Those two things keep me sane. Um, and, and you asked me before we spoke, is there one more thing I wanted to say? And what I, what I want to talk about very briefly is the K Mason Foundation. It's a charity I set up with Desmond Tutu uh, in memory of my sister Kay. And we help incredible kids who grow up in very difficult circumstances in South Africa get great educations. If you're feeling sad today, if you want some hope in the world, go to kmf.org.za, read some of their stories, hear them talk to you, maybe help them, and I guarantee you that nothing will lift your COVID spirits more than helping an amazing kid get an education. That is beautiful. And I have been working with you with the KMF. Uh, you have, absolutely. And definitely, I will put that link below as well. I think it's beautiful. Thank you for that. Thank you for everything. Thank you for your time. Congratulations. Thank you, Tessie. And I miss you. I love you. And we speak offline very soon. Can't wait. Thank you.